All right, we're going to be opening up the meeting now, and what is the process? Uh, so far, I have three individuals uh, that had signed in. Uh, the first one in, in order of their sign-in is uh, Patricia uh, Waiters, a Monica Stromwell, and Jeff Goldstein. So uh, right now, I, I think the understanding was they were going to stay here. We we're going to break out for the executive session. Then I'd come down and get the individuals one at a time. That sounds good. Do we have to take attendance or read the um, officially open? Officially open yeah, it? Yeah. We can officially open if you like. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll do the uh, open public meeting notification. This meeting is being held in conformity of the Open Public Meeting Act. Proper notice has been uh, placed in local papers on January 25, 2014 and January 26, 2014. If any board member or member of the public in attendance believes that the meeting is in violation of the Open Public Meeting Act, the Hoboken Board of Education requests that they make a statement at this time. Seeing none, the board wishes to make those in attendance aware of this meeting is being recorded on video and will be broadcast by the board at a later date on cable TV channel 77 and Fios channel 46. The Hoboken Board of Education is committed to preserving the decorum of the public process and is mindful that we live in an electronic age of computers, cell phones, and other electronic communication devices. Nevertheless, we respectfully request that all meeting participants kindly silence their electronic devices during the course of the meeting. And if use of the, de the device is necessary, we ask that you please leave the meeting room and conduct personal business outside. Thank you. And uh, if we could please rise for the salute of the flag. Should like to make a motion to go into an executive session. Take attendance. Motion. But attendance. attendance. Okay, that's even better. <laughs> Mr. Biancamano. Present. Miss Evans. Present. Mr. Klupfel. Here. Uh, Miss McAllister. Here. Miss Mitchell. Here. Uh, Ms. Uh, Rhodes Kearns, uh, she called earlier. She could not make it. She's uh, ill at the, at the moment, so she's not present. Uh, Ms. Sobolo? Here. And Dr. Gold? Here. Okay, that passes. Okay. Now I'd like to make a motion to go into an executive session. Motion. Okay. And the meeting will be, the purpose will be to discuss some applicants for the vacant. Uh, Board seat. Roll roll. Uh, okay. Roll roll. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Bianca Mana. Aye. Miss Evans. Yes. Ms. Uh, Mr. Cluffell. Yes. Miss McAllister. Yes. Miss Mitchell. Yes. Miss Sobolov. Yes. And Dr. Gold. Yes. Okay. So we're going to go to the. Okay. Uh, this is the logistics. We're going to come out of this meeting. We're then going to take a five-minute break so we could take a rest stop. Then we're going to have the real budget meeting from 7 to 8.30 or whatever. Then we're going to come back and have the school board meeting. So right now, for the next hour or so, it's not a school board meeting. It is um, a town hall presentation. So please release us and let us get out of executive session. Okay, do you want me to take a roll? Please. To come out of a closed session, Mr. Biancamano? Aye. Ms. Evans? Yes. Ms. Kufel? Yes. Ms. McAllister? Yes. Ms. Mitchell? Yes. Ms. Sobolov? Yes. And Dr. Gold? Yes. Okay, we're so now we're going to um, take five minutes, then after the meeting, we're then going to vote on um, the new board member, and we'll have a school board meeting. So right now we're free. Do you need another five minutes? So good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out for our budget forum tonight. The budget forum will do a lot of things. We, we hope to accomplish quite a few things as far as um, clearing up maybe some misperceptions about the school district budget, but also giving you lots of good information so you could decide how you feel about our school district budget. I would like to do a few introductions. First of all, assisting me tonight with the presentation, doing a significant part of the presentation will be Bill Moffitt, our school business administrator, our board secretary. Um, 
You, you probably couldn't find a more experienced school business official, and so we're very fortunate to have Bill here. Um, in addition to his experience working for the Patterson Public Schools and, and in his experience also as a business administrator in Elba Park, on top of all that, he also has experience working for the Department of Ed. So he is um, a, a person who worked, in fact, for the Division of Finance, but specifically for charter school finance. And so that is a topic that will come along. We'll talk a little bit about the charter school issues. And like I said, you could not find a, a better person to be able to have a discussion, someone who has more expertise than I out there. I'd like to um, also introduce the board members, the members of the Finance Committee, directly responsible, overseeing our, our budget, directly responsible for working with the administration to develop the budget. So I'd like to introduce Tom Klupfeld, Finance Chair. Okay. Leon Gold, who is our board president, member of all committees, and also Irene Sobolov. So normally we have four members on the committee. Right now we have three members, but um, over the next few weeks I'm sure the board will identify a fourth member. So the presentation tonight will cover a lot of different things. Um, we could give you a little bit of a, you know, everyone here has seen the TV show Mythbusters, right? And so what we do, we have, we have a session where we're going to bust some myths. We have um, a, a section about budget factors, so some factors that, that have an influence on our budget. We have um, a discussion about the 1450, but 1415 budget, our upcoming budget, and the process that we follow to get to a new budget. We're going to talk a little bit about our district goals, and we're going to talk about the ins and outs of the budget, the revenue side, and um, how our revenue part is put together. So that'll be uh, Mr. Moffat that'll be covering that. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to get to the part about the Mythbusters, okay? So one of the myths that exists out there, sometimes people say, is that the district is easily able to cut the budget by millions of dollars. We're overfunded, and we have all sorts of room to reduce our budget, okay? And so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about that, because there are some factors that are very important to understand when it comes to the budget, and you also understand that the ability to cut millions of dollars from the budget is not really possible. So if you look to the right, you see our 2010 budget, and if you look at the key at the bottom, you can see that there is a tax levy cap, okay? There's a proposed budget tax levy, there's a minimum tax levy. So as a former Abbott district, what happens is the state gives a minimum tax levy, okay, a minimum tax levy. And the reason that the state gives a minimum tax levy for former Abbott districts, still to this day, is because the state has invested a significant money, a significant amount of funding in all these former Abbott districts. And so what they did was they determined, well, we're not just going to invest in the districts and then allow them to reduce the tax levy. In the meantime, we're increasing their state income activity. So they set the safety net themselves, so you have this minimum tax level. And you can see that over the years, we're fairly close. In 2010, there's some differences, but if you look at the three years, 2011, 2012, 2013, the minimum tax levy and the budget tax levy were fairly close. One year almost exactly the same. In other words, the district could not reduce in 2011. There was no way that the district could have reduced the budget even by one dollar unless it was somewhere outside the tax levy, which is hard to do when we talk about some other things. So there's a lot to understand about school budgets. And so people who went to school, they have masters, they have doctorates. It's a very challenging topic because there's a lot of intricacies, there's a lot of different details, there's a lot of different laws that apply to school finance. And one of the things that people can get out of this particular meeting is that in a lot of cases, there aren't many options. There's really not a whole lot that the board can do about the budget. There are some decisions to be made. There's some tough decisions to be made. We'll talk about that. But as far as most of the budget process, most of the things about that, there's a lot of things that are required, things that you cannot avoid. Okay, so that is our situation. There has been and continues to be a minimum tax levy. And the minimum tax levy is something, like I said, that is not going to go away. It's going to be there. And so we can move along to the next slide. Okay. So the next slide is a slide that we will discuss now. And there's some other follow-up things that people have asked about 
um, in the question and answer section. So the community has provided a few questions about what goes on with Yoga. I had that, I had that website set up, the, the email address for a bunch of questions that were open at kfl.ajjwest. So some people have responded, and we'll cover this twice for them. So the question about our budget and um, the cost for people and the amount of money that we spent. It's interesting, the, the core design administration changed the school funding formula. So there was a school funding formula that was used in New Jersey for many years. Um, the core design administration came with a new formula. It was hashed out over a number of years. It was in court, out of court. The bottom line is that the state Supreme Court determined that the new funding formula was constitutional. One of the features of the school funding formula School funding formula that it is still the law today is there's an adequacy budget calculation. An adequacy budget calculation. Does they get that up? Did they get that chart? Yes, Same in 2014, 
it dropped where about $180,000 below adequate sale. Again, these are statistics from the Department of Ed. These are our, our adequacy budget figures. So, very important concept, something that, that will definitely drive our budget and the expectations for what we should have for a school budget. Like I said, on the back side, there's some more, more information about, about how, how this works out. out. It's, it's a little more detailed. detailed. And, then and then on top of that, there is, is um, like I said, there's a whole document. document. It's, it's, um, it's called All Children, All Communities. And it's something, like I said, that's available on the web. So, so now as far as questions go, we're going to have a question. Okay. Right. right. That, that's a, a good question. I, I didn't work here in 2010, 2011, but the calculation, the student population may have changed. Uh, reduction in students, the number of students attending the district, the types of students that remain in the district, those are all factors that could have played a part. Um, charter school expansion might have meant that more of our students left the district at that time. So there's a lot of different explanations. I don't, I don't know for sure why that happened. Yes, sir. We're going to go, though, we are going to... Yep. The difference, so the state is mandating that you spend an extra $5,000 minimally for at-risk kids versus basic kids. Is that how it might be? That's the basic idea. Mm -hmm. So they're expecting, it's, it's, well, the answer is yes or no. Okay. So the law of the land is still the state aid formula and the rules that happened under John Corzine. However, the state also does different things. For example, some years they just flat fund the whole thing and say you're getting whatever you got last year, regardless of what kind of changes you have in your student population. So the other thing they do is they underfund it. So we're not the only district that's underfunded, so I want to make that clear. Right? There's other districts that are significantly underfunded, but um, it's just kind of a general guideline. So, you know, the The adequacy thing is a, it's a guideline for, well, you, you have to follow it only because you have to also go to the county superintendent and the state, they have to approve your budget and they look at your budget and they look at, and you also have to sign off as a superintendent that you believe that the budget, budget adequately meets the needs of the students. So it's there for information, for informational purposes so that taxpayers, People understand that, okay, is it reasonable? Is the budget that is presented to us, is that something that's reasonable? And so that's really why it's there. It's not, it's not a hard, fast number. It doesn't, and it, it is different. What I'm talking about is not the state aid formula, right? So don't confuse this with the state aid formula, because it's not. It's adequacy budget and a calculation of what the state expects us to be spending about. It's not always exactly because of the science, okay? Um, so anyway, that's, um, that's our adequacy budget. You want to move along? Okay. So the other, the other myth I, I want to talk about, people have said since I've been here, that charter schools don't have much impact on the district's finances, and in some cases they actually save the district money. Okay. So what I'd like to do is I would like to talk about the charter schools in terms of their impact on the district budget. Right now, the charter schools account for 15%, so the money that comes from the district, so this is an important factor, and not to say anything about charter schools, but they are at this point 15% of our budget. So they started out about seven years ago, I'm sorry, seven years ago, I have information back to, oh, five years ago, $4 million was the allocation. Now our charter school allocation is at 7.8 million. So there's been a significant increase. Over seven years, which I was referring to, seven years ago it was 2.8 million. Now it's an increase of $5 million to 7.8 million. So it definitely is a larger piece of the pie. And if you were to go back and do that chart that we did a few minutes ago, where it was 15%, it would, you could see a bigger piece of the pie every year is the charter schools. And yet, see the, the issue is that our enrollment hasn't really changed all that much. So that's, that's the thing, and, and now, the more complicated factor is the fact that we have some enrollment growth. So because we have a little bit of enrollment growth, it's not, it doesn't work out quite the way people think as far as money following students and so on and so forth. So that's the whole thing about um, you know, just the charter school impact. Okay. 
So now, what we want to talk about a little bit, there's, there's a lot of discussion about what it is that um, goes into calculating the charter school allocation. The first thing to understand is that the Department of Ed is completely responsible for that. The Department of Ed calculates how much money the charter school will receive as far as an allocation. The Department of Ed calculates how much state aid the charter schools receive. Local Board of Ed has no influence over any of that and really absolutely no options as far as determining how much any of the charter schools receive. There's, there's no leeway. It's a state calculation. What we'd like to do is ask Bill to come and talk a little bit about this particular screen. Huh? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, as far as the payment calculation, it, it's, a, it's a formula, it's a process to get to a number, and it, it, we receive it as part of our state aid notice, so it's basically when we receive the aid of that year, we also get the number that we're to transfer to charter schools. So in that, cal is there, in that notification, there's a calculation uh, to arrive at this payment or this transfer, money that's basically due to the various charter schools. We have about five, three are the bigger ones. So uh, that calculation, among other things, and not to confuse too many people, they have a cost per pupil, which is usually weighted if there's a special ed population out in a, a charter school or if there's an at-risk amount out in the charter school. So they'll weight it a little differently. But if we just blend that all together, we have 11,866. Again, this is all information based on last year's information. Um, so that arrives at 7.8 million, and that means 658 students are at the various sites, meaning the charter schools. And of course, the district will make payment to the individual charter schools out of our accounts payable system. But what I wanted to highlight is, because it was kind of misconstrued over time, it, it's a statistic that takes a, a life of its own, is it's just a way to arrive at a number that everyone agreed upon at one point in time with the legislature that how much money do we have follow the child. So what happens is we get into this, this back and forth on cost per pupil. But of that 11,866, we can say, just to say New Jersey calculates this for us as well, because they tell us the amount that goes out, 89% uh, is funded through your property tax. So that's supported by, again, 80, 89% of that amount, the $7.8 million number, which is roughly $6.9 million, is raised through your property tax, which is the local tax levy. So that is part of it. The other piece, which is the 11%, is what they've identified as the state aid that would go and follow that student conceptually. Again, it's 89, your taxes from Hoboken, and then 11% comes from state aid that they've identified. Again, it's no, I don't take it out of a, a separate account and send that 11%. It all just goes as a transfer out of our budget into the charter schools. To give you a little bit of understanding, because if you try to work the percentages out, it doesn't really match up to a lot of the other cost per pupil statistics that are out there. And I just wanted to throw one up on the bottom there for you to, to take a look at, because that's also related to last year's budget, and that was advertised, and that cost per pupil is 18849 That's if you just do the division uh, based on our own budget divided by our own enrollment. So that would be our cost per pupil. Now that cost per pupil also will include the charter school al allocation, just so you know. So again, this is a very complicated issue, and we, we, we get into this cycle of uh, per pupil spending and comparisons and uh, the concept of maybe a tuition rate, but that's not what it is. It's, it's purely a way to come up with a number that is to be given over to the charter schools. So hopefully that uh, elaborates on some of the information that's been swirling out there. Um, and again, we can go over it further at, at the end if you want to hold your questions till later. But Superintendent, okay. so let's go to the next one. Okay, so another, um, another, another concern that's been expressed is regarding administrative costs, okay? So what we did was we put together just a, a slide to just quickly demonstrate that over the years, the board, the, um, the school district has done a lot to reduce administrative costs. So you could see in 2010, our administrative costs were 3.8 million, okay? That is audited, so that's what our auditor is saying we spent on administrative costs. You go down to 2014, this year we expect to spend 2.7 million. So you could see there's a reduction in administrative costs over five years by 1.1 million. So there's a significant amount of um, reduced administrative costs. Very important thing, and uh, nobody likes to think that there's really high administrative costs. The Board of Ed has done a wonderful job. The school district has done a job to reduce administrative costs. Next thing, legal costs. 
So this you'll find interesting. The district has excessive legal costs. Okay, so the district has come a long way in terms of legal costs. And so what you could see on the right is that in 2010, there were $295,000 worth of judgments against the district. So that's part of our legal costs. If the Board of Ed has a court case that is decided and it's not in the favor of the Board of Ed and there's a number attached to that, a financial impact, then that is a legal cost. So the other thing to know is in 2010 and 2011, our legal costs, our legal costs included an in-house attorney. So that included an attorney that worked here full-time, salary plus benefits. So whether you have an attorney as we do now, who works independently of the Board of Ed and is not an employee, but is brought in um, for, for legal services, or whether or not you have an in-house attorney, the, the fact of the matter is there's legal costs either way, right? And so I think that's a fair comparison. And like I said, you could see the judgments against the district really had an effect on legal costs to the point where in 2011, our legal costs were almost $600,000. Okay. Times have improved since then. And you can see now, I'm very happy about the fact that 2013, we have no judgments against the district. 2014, no judgments against the district. And in 2012, it was only 9,500. And we, we expect to put together a budget this year where you will see no judgments against the district. So that's, that's an important thing that I think makes a big difference for the district because those are all things, those are all, um, as, as we said with our district goal, we want to invest as much money as we can in the classroom. So if we have high legal costs, and on top of that, we have judgments against the district, well, that, will, um, that, that is all money that's taken away because the budget changes to cover all these legal costs. Okay, should we move on? Okay, next thing, myth six. Hoboken Public Schools continue to lose students. So the general trend that we have right now is that at our lower grade levels, we have a nice increase in our student population. In the preschool, we have a nice increase in student population. At the high school, we have a nice increase in student population, keeping in mind that we have some very small upper grade classes. So our 11th grade has, I think, about 85, 87 students total. That's a graduating class next year of 85, somewhere in that range. And then in the senior class, in the senior class this year, they're just a little over 100. That's it. So we have a very small junior and senior class at the high school. We once had populations of 130, 140 students. Those classes are very small, but on the other end, we have some good population in the freshman class. So we have about 170 students in the freshman class, and we have about 150 in the sophomore class. So those classes keep moving up. Our high school population grows, and um, we're also having a nice number. We have about 220 kids in our, um, in, in our junior high program, the seventh and eighth grade. So we have some good enrollment. The rest of the grade levels, we have about 100 students. Okay, so after, after second grade, it evens off, and every grade level has about 100 children. So that is our enrollment population, but you could see, okay, that as you go along, our enrollment, our audited number for this year, 2385, okay? That was the audited number. That does not include our district placements, I'm thinking? Uh, the audited numbers would include out-of-district placements. It does, okay. Yeah, right. it would include. Yeah. But keep in mind that on the left, right, it's 2240, the top is 2400, that's not a big scale. So you have to keep that in mind as well. They're not huge differences, not huge differences in population. Should we keep going? Okay. Myth seven, the school choice program does not have any benefit to the district. Now, people have debated this, and I've heard this during the campaign, I've heard it during lots of different discussions about school choice in the school district, that there is really no benefit to this, the school system. Now, there are a number of benefits. One, we have some very good students who have come to the school district from other communities. And so we certainly enjoy having them in the school district. Two, there is an enormous financial impact, an enormous impact that if you imagine our world as, as a board member or as a member of the community without school choice, we would have a very different school system. We would have some serious, serious issues that we would have to deal with. So you could see in 2010, school choice only $126,000 we received in school choice aid. And you can see that increases. And you can see in 2014, our budget this year, we expect 2.8 million. That's a lot of money. That's a, that's a significant amount of funding for the school district. And it helps us to deal 
with some of the issues we've had as far as uh, loss of enrollment, in some cases loss of enrollment to charter schools, in other cases people moving out of the community. So we do have some good students that, like I said, we, we enjoy having in the district, and they also bring a lot of funding with them, and so that's, a, that's another wonderful thing. Um, so we move on. Hoboken Public Schools have lost enrollment, yet we have not adjusted our staffing. So our next, okay, so there we go. Our payroll, so in 2010, 28 million was, was, our, was our budget for payroll. And you can see in 2014, our payroll is 27,684. And so you're saying to yourself, okay, so it dropped and it went way back up. But like all issues with school finance and all things with the budget, the details are a very important thing. So there's a detail that needs to be recognized. The detail is that one, we hired, we had a few retirements, we had a lot of retirements a few years ago. We hired people, they're moving up on the salary guide. So there's gonna be some natural increases there. But the other factor is that in 2014, this year, we took over for Catapult. So it's money we're not paying out to Catapult Learning to educate children, it's that we're paying our own employees now. So some of the preschool teachers are now our employees. So the number would be significantly less. But I don't want anyone saying, you know, you're misrepresenting, that is our payroll, but there are some factors involved with that. Like I said, the moving along of staff members, moving up the salary guide, plus the addition of a number of employees to take over for catapult learning, okay? So that's some um, payroll. Okay, now we're gonna get into the section about our budget factors. So Bill, you're gonna take over? Sure, Ken. Yeah, th this is the budget factor section. These are trends. We look for various things during the budget period that we can put our fingers on and, and try to predict where the trends are going. You, know, you got an upward trend, you got downward trends, you hope they balance out. You hope it's not gonna absorb some of your resources that are available to maybe allocate into different programs. So it's part of the budget process and these are the trends that, that we look for and they're very pre they're pretty visible when you start looking at it from the uh, onset. Um, on top of the fiscal trends and historical trends, uh, there are some realities that the superintendent spoke to earlier about being a, a former Abbott district. Uh, there are certain regulations that apply to us in the past that still have a residual impact on our budget and the process that we uh, use to put the budget together. Uh, one of which is school-based budgeting. That was a process where the Department of Education, since the state was investing a lot of money in what they called whole school reform, which was an outgrowth of the Abbott v. Burke decisions, um, they wanted to have a say on what, the, what resources were located at the school level. So they had this approval process uh, and they identified uh, those resources, meaning school-based resources, out in what they call in another fund, in Fund 15. So they're separate and distinct, and that's still residual, meaning they can come back at any time and start reviewing them, because over the past few years, uh, they were very involved in our day-to-day -day operation, and they pulled back, although the money is still basically a part of our base and the revenue, they still have these what I call strings attached so that in the event they want to come back in, they're still there. So we budget differently because we're a former Abbott. Uh, we have mandated school level programs. During that review uh, with the whole school reform effort earlier, uh, they would, meaning the state of New Jersey, would want to see certain programs funded with their money um, that would address some of the faults and issues that were part of this court case in whole school reform. A couple are parent out outreach. They wanted to see activities for parent outreach. They wanted to see after school programs and uh, field trips because they identify that uh, as part of this group of Abbott districts, which are about 30 to, uh, statewide, that they had an unusually high uh, amount of poverty within the district. So they wanted to see these programs because they felt that they would address the uh, issues that uh, they were trying to remediate. Um, also part of that uh, whole school reform was what they call preschool. Uh, aid, which was uh, groundbreaking at the time, although it seems like we're hearing about New York City and New York State about funding preschool. The state of New Jersey has done that. It's separate and distinct. It's not part of our operating budget, but I have to be aware of it because it's a separate budget, um, and, but that is a residual impact on our operation. So we do have a preschool program. We'll go into that a little bit later. And uh, the School Development Authority is basically the last major string that they control, meaning the state of New Jersey. They're part of our approval process as it relates to our facilities. So anytime we want to uh, renovate a room or uh, remediate a facade, uh, we have to get their approval because they're funding us 100%, but they have to approve it and then fund it. Right now, we, it's a little bit of a delay 
and that's a big impact on me. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more. Yeah, the School Development Authority, I'd like to talk about that because that is, that is an interesting topic for all of you residents of Hoboken who are interested in school facilities. Okay, so the bottom line is that, and, and this is something, if you want to be angry about something, this is something to be angry about. Okay, residents of this community spent an inordinate amount of money building school buildings. Okay, and over time, right, 100 years ago, most of the buildings were built, and over time, there's different things that the, the community has done to upgrade them, put in new windows, things like that. And then comes the School Development Authority. So while on one hand, they fund 100% of our school improvement projects, on the other hand, there's not a whole lot that they're doing. So what does that mean to you? It means even if you as a community said, you know what we really need, we really need, and everyone agrees, every, every single resident of the community agrees, we need a fantastic new high school. And we would love to have a new high school, you can't do it because the SDA has to determine that that's needed. And they have actually determined these types of things are needed, but they just haven't funded it. So, and the other thing is that in terms of renovation, okay, you have buildings that ultimately residents of this city have paid for, have invested in, and yet the SDA, it's a big issue. The amount of money that's being spent to maintain them now is not what's necessary. You have 100 year old buildings and they need work. They need different things to be done. You know about the whole Connor School situation, that was something that we dealt with years ago, a project that was supposed to go ahead that just stopped. So I would imagine, I, like I said, that, that is a very frustrating thing. And, and you see that in all of the former Abbott districts where people are saying, hey, listen, we have some real facility needs here. And all, everyone who lives here agrees that there are certain repair jobs, there are certain things that need to be done. And we would love to do this for our children. We'd love to have new boilers. We'd love to have lots of other things. We'd love to have um, a new roof or a new exterior. All that is possible, but only with the SDA funding it and with their approval. So like I said, even if the entire community felt that it was necessary, these are your own buildings. You can't even invest in your own buildings. That's kind of a strange thing, but that is the reality with um, the Schools Development Authority. It's an interesting situation. Let me take this. Sure. Okay. So one, one other factor that affects our budget, and this is an important factor, okay? You could see that in 2010, our total costs for special education, and this is not unusual to our district. This is something that goes on in every other district. Special education costs to continue to increase. Services, required services continue to increase. So as time goes by, you have an increase in our special ed costs. So now in 2014, you have um, a total budget for special education that is now $5,410,000. Significant amount of money that is in our budget. Very important thing to be aware of. And it is, like I said, a factor that affects our budget. It is a non-negotiable item. For the most part, there's really not a whole lot the district, the board, anyone can do to reduce this amount of funding because it is based on need. Ultimately, there are agreements made there are contracts essentially signed with an IEP that says these are the services we will provide, these are services that are appropriate. And again, like every other state, like every other school district, budgets are developed based on student need. The higher the level of student need, the more that the district has to invest in each of those students to make sure they get a good education. All right, if I could just add for a minute too, and you might not be able to see on the bottom, there is specialized transportation services also involved in implementing the individual uh, education plan. That's not reflected here. Uh, just uh, that's in another area of the budget, but this is just purely special ed tuition and, and uh, special ed related services. So uh, I just wanted to point that out. Okay, now this is an area, okay, so health insurance, another budget factor in every school district. And what you'll be happy to see as residents of the community is that the board did some things with negotiations with the teachers union that is a, is a benefit. One, we moved to the state health benefit plan. Two, the state health benefit plan, as part of their cost structure, does not have a traditional plan. So there's a significant amount of money that's been saved with the new teachers contract, and you can see the significant reduction in the cost of the district for um, health insurance. And you should also understand that that also reflects so the fact that we have fewer employees. So we don't have as many, many employees. And also many of our employees, now that we have newer employees, are single, right? We don't, we don't necessarily have everybody with full family benefits. So there's a change in the composition of our, of our staff. But the point being that there's still a significant amount of savings 
almost $2 million worth of savings on, on health benefits. So a significant reduction in a, in a very important area that drives every school district budget. Okay, food service. An interesting topic here in Hoboken because the district for many years, for a variety of reasons, lost money on a food service, on school lunch, primarily school lunch. Okay. There are other things that have happened. For example, we have Hurricane Sandy. That contributes to losses, right? You don't have lunch during that time period. You have equipment that's destroyed. You have things like that. But the fact is that the Board of Ed has, um, first of all, a few years ago, the Board of Ed had um, our own in-house food service. In other words, we, all, all the people who worked there were our employees. Then they went to a company called Chartwells. Chartwells was a food service management company. Now we've gone to Sodexo. So the issue, for some of that, some of that amount where you see the food service and the cost, there's a deficit. What that is, that's a deficit, which means that's money that we lost, okay? Now, it's not that money that we lost every year. It's a cumulative deficit. So in 2010, our deficit was, we lost 292,000. The year after that, we lost about another $400,000 more. The year after that, we lost another 300,000. Then we lost another 100,000. Now we brought it back down to 950,000, okay? It's, so it's reduced, but it's still not where, where it's needed to be. The point is that the Board of Ed and the administration we put together a new plan. We put together um, different ways to try to recoup some of that money. And so we very aggressively went out because a lot of it had to do with people who simply weren't paying for lunch. That's part of the deficit. People not paying for lunch. We didn't have the collections we should have. We didn't have a computerized system to track and make sure we had good records. So now we have that. We have a good computer system. We track all of our lunches. We connect that to our, our, our student software so we know exactly where the students are so the principals can look up if someone owes money for school lunch, they can look that up. And then as time goes by, one, we have, a, we, have, we have a good increase in the number of students eating school lunch, eating school breakfast, and so our food service deficit, hopefully over the next few years, will be reduced. And so that's what we're working towards over the next few years. Right, that, that's a big piece and that leads into my section, which I'm trying to give a, a flavor of what's going on on the inside of the district. From the outside, it might look that it's a two, three month process. Uh, in the business office, it's a year round uh, job for us. It's a task. We, we make sure the budget uh, for this year is, is consistent to what our goals are. We want to make sure that the expenses are being tracked in the right areas so that when we go to build next year's budget, that that base budget is correct. So um, part of that base being correct, um, as the year is opening up, it's July, it's September, uh, I review it again with staff pretty much on a weekly basis to make sure all the staff positions are in place. Yes. Um, I, I know that I have a couple of collective bargaining agreements that will be expiring at the end of the year, so that's a big part of my planning. Um, I know the administrator's expired at the end of last fiscal year, so I got to take that into consideration when I build the budget uh, for a recommendation. Uh, again, I, I start having internal discussions not only with the superintendent, but uh, potentially uh, other budget managers, like principals, what they need, what they think they're gonna need for next year as far as enrollment. So I'm starting to bring that information into the central office. I'm also looking to maintain what we already have, making sure we have the resources available and are supporting the programs that are our initiatives. And again, I, I, I pay strict attention on making sure this year's base budget is accurate. Um, some enrollment possessions, that's a pretty big part, uh, part of the enrollment uh, projections this year that I'm utilizing will be about 96 children, uh, which is roughly about 5% growth rate. Majority of that is going to be at the elementary level. Uh, I'll put this in a slide later. It's actually 75 total at the elementary, roughly in the high 40s just for our kindergarten alone. There's also a concern I have at the second grade level because there's a pretty large population there. Uh, middle school is relatively flat. It may be up to, under two but it's probably relatively flat, I'll say it's a negative two. And uh, it looks like, as the superintendent alluded to earlier, this uh, support, my enrollment projections support the growth at the high school level. So we're expecting about 20 students there. Special ed is a concern as far as any type of fluctuation in enrollment, if there's a, a trend, like we were looking at the charts before. Uh, I, I sat with the um, director of special education and uh, we were going back and forth. It looks like they'll range in between 32 students and 35 students next year, uh, but we don't think more than 35. So those are all things I'm taking into consideration when I build the budget. Charter schools, since that's a big part of my um, 
budget. It's obviously a big part of my uh, worries uh, because in this year, uh, you know, I was advised that they, they being uh, OLA, will be expanding into the sixth grade, which they've never had in the past. Why is that important to me as a budget manager? Because I have to come up with the, the funds to offset that from the budget. So that's roughly about $750,000 for those uh, 45 kids, we'll say 44, and then there's another increase that's projected uh, at Elysian, which is about 11, and then there's about 10 at Hoboken Charter. Now, the reason I know the enrollment is we confirm all enrollment as part of the process to pay uh, the charter schools, so we track, because basically all charter schools have to come back to the district of residence, register, so that we can verify that they exist and that they can get paid at the charter school. So uh, that's all information that's based on actual data. Um, some school level goals, um, as I start uh, sitting down with, with uh, managers on a more formal basis, um, it usually ends up in December, I sit down with each, uh, like I said, uh, Principal, we go over their own individual budget. I talk about their spending, where they are in their budget, what resources they may need. Um, I look at some of the, uh, the basic components of an education, make sure they're uh, covered. Any type of unique programs, as we say, the Abbott District. The, the legacy is, for example, uh, there's, there may be an um, after-school program. That's part of that legacy that I have to make sure is going to be funded again this year, or if it's something that's in a Title I section of the NCLB budget, which is a federal grant, I have to be worried about if they're not going to fund it this year, if the general fund is going to have to budget. So those are things I have to gauge as I'm having these conversations with uh, the different budget managers. Um, special education goals, again, we, we've already talked about out of district placements. Uh, again, I sit down with the director, we go over some of his base budget. His individual budget covers evaluations for students, uh, various different types of therapy, like uh, occupational therapy, speech therapy, things that are required as per IEP. Sometimes there's even requirements for certain type of devices that we have to fund also as a supplier material. So those are all things we, we review. Um, and then I see the future goals with him. Uh, in this case, uh, some important items that we were looking at has to do with the autistic uh, program at uh, Wallace in the junior senior high school. Uh, there was a concern about expanding the ESY part uh, program, and that's ESY, for those that might not know, is a little piece, we'll say about 18 to 20 days in the summer, that some students need to keep advancing in their, uh, in their academics. So that is part of the IEP. We would then potentially bring them back to a less restrictive environment over the summer, and we work to bring all the students back to the least restrictive environment within Hoboken, which is closer to the community. And again, it's, a, it's like a trickle-down uh, process where as we, re, I'll say, uh, bring the students back, they go into a less restrictive environment like a self-contained individual class, and then they may come out the following year into like a, uh, a resource-supported education called mainstreaming. So then I have to worry about resources for the resource room because that supports that child's development over time. And as we bring more students back and they trickle down to the mainstream environment, that resource center becomes more and more important on a budgetary basis as well as operationally at the school level. Um, technology goal, goals that uh, we talked about, um, again, the, 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 it's to maintain our systems. Uh, we have a couple major systems, uh, the, the information system at the food service level, but we also have student information system that we have to make sure is maintained. Uh, we have connectivity issues that we have to make sure are maintained at the instructional level in all the schools. Uh, we have to make sure all our devices work. And uh, this year we were uh, proud to say again, we received additional funding through uh, this Hurricane Sandy grant from the United Arab Emirates. So we want to make sure that the budget for this year supports that and that we maximize that grant. That grant is roughly $819,000. So, uh, and that's going to basically re. Uh, repair and upgrade our technology uh, network system throughout the, the district. So uh, that, that's, that's going to be fun for me because I get to spend somebody else's money. Um, some other areas that we got into is uh, the cycling of computers. So we have, a, you know, say 300 uh, computers in our inventory. They may be outdated in three years, five years, so we wanted to develop a uh, re uh, recycling type pro program where we would then recycle those computers as we've replaced them and redeploy them in another environment like maybe a high school computer is then redeployed at the elementary level. So that's uh, some of the information that we would support uh, that process with a lease purchase 
application, small one, about 100,000 a year. We'd like to get on a cycle where for every year we get $100,000 on a lease purchase. We buy equipment to replace other equipment uh, and redeploy the old ones that can, we can reuse. Um, security goals, again, I, I sit down and make sure that we have the resources available to support our existing security systems, uh, entry, surveillance, those type of things. We like to add and expand the best we can. Uh, so those resources have to be there. Again, it, this is all behind the scenes. I know it's a little dry for some, but it's a, it's a very large uh, part of what we do on a day-to-day day -day basis. Facilities, is, again, it's huge right now because uh, we're coming out of the, all the damage from Hurricane Sandy. We're still working to resolve some issues. We have some uh, uh, applications in with FEMA, so we we'll have to coordinate with that. We have some insurance money we're still waiting on. Um, you know, those type of resources that go into rebuilding uh, we have to coordinate, again, at the facility level. Again, these are all the boring things that uh, we make fun of Tim about in the back office because no one you know, really thinks of what's in the walls, the electricity, the water, the gas, but you know, his budget pays for that and any type of improvement. So uh, we go over that, any type of preventative maintenance program that we want, we have to make sure we have the resources and property insurance. Um, with that, that, there's a couple transportation issues too. I, as far as a dis, uh, district fleet of vehicles, I want to maintain those. If there's buses that need to be replaced or addressed, those are things that we would look into. I know we're looking to uh, acquire a couple other buses that we're trying to look at, at least uh, for more efficient, less cost type scenarios, we're trying to get maybe a used bus right now, but we're just you know, throwing that around in the back office to see. Because when I go here in the revenue projections, because as I start building the budget, then I have to worry about scenarios. I have to worry about how much money the state of New Jersey is going to uh, increase state aid or decrease state aid, where the money is coming from. So uh, a few people from the general public and the board uh, wanted me just to touch on some of the different types of aid at this point before I dive into the revenue piece, which uh, you have at the state level and the federal level, you have uh, what I consider to be general fund. It goes for your operating budget. That is roughly the, um, the formula-based state aid. So those include uh, special education aid, uh, school choice. Extraordinary aid is part of it. Extraordinary aid is an application which is a little unique, but it's supposed to offset the cost of high, uh, uh, high expenditure uh, individual uh, IEPs, I call them, individual education plans, high cost students, we can apply to the state of New Jersey for anything over, say, 50000 we would get some money back. So uh, we would go through that process of applying, and at the end of the fiscal year, which is always odd and fun for me, is wait to see how much they're going to actually give me, because I'll make an assumption on at this stage of the budget, and then wait for the state of New Jersey to either tell me it's going to be more or less. And uh, it, it, usually it's like May, June when they tell me which I have to wait till that time and you have to budgetarily accommodate that bad decision is meaning I get less than I expect. Um, there's another section of state aid which is restricted. It's also uh, federal aid is restricted where they give you money for specific uses. So uh, preschool aid is one of those. So we like as a residual Abbott v. Burke type uh, scenario, that is about $10 million and that's strictly for that use. Non-public is a, a, a big, uh, say about I think it was at $350,000 in non-public. That's basically a flow-through amount that is put on the books of Hoboken, but that we then disperse through the non-public sector as far as uh, parochial schools and whatnot. And it's for textbook nursing, special education, which is the 192, 193, and then technology. So that's, again, it's just a flow-through. We don't receive anything. There's no administrative fee or any of that. It just goes right through to those various parochial schools. And then there's federal restricted. I think everyone's heard about uh, no Child Left Behind, that's restricted again for specific pieces uh, and activities. That's not part of my operating budget. It's outside of it, it's separate, uh, as well as the IDEA, which is uh, for uh, special needs students. And then there are each within those IDEA grants and NCLB grants, there's usually a public, uh, uh, non, I should say a non-public portion. So the parochial schools within Hoboken would have uh, a chance to get some of that money. And we have to monitor that and dispense that as well. So those are generally the types of aid that uh, come into our budget. Uh, from time to time, we, we're surprised, and we, there's a new category of aid that the state uh, provides us. In this case, last year's big winners were the under adequacy aid. Uh, they, as a group, which we're heading towards, as we saw in the, the, the program earlier, since we're sliding down into the uh, under adequacy uh, budget, 
Um, there were districts statewide that received up to $500,000 in additional state aid uh, when the notices came out about this time last year. Again, when I say this time, it's February, March when we know. So will this happen? Will that affect us? I don't know. I'm going to monitor it as we go forward. Uh, but that's just a, an example of how things can change with the, uh, the governor's budget. Uh, the revenue picture for uh, us right here, um, again, the, it's our operating budget, things for our day-to-day -day activities, about $51.5 million. Local tax levy is the $37 million number on top. And then the second largest piece, obviously, is the state aid. Um, that's just a general picture. Uh, what I would like to pick, uh, point out is in miscellaneous revenue, there's a, an amount of money that we receive as rent. It's about, I want to say it's about 300000 and that's rent that we receive from two charter schools. One is uh, Hoboken Charter School, and the other one is uh, Lesion. So that's, uh, a, a, again, a, an amount of money that I expect to receive every year. But again, when we talk about an increasing enrollment, I have to consider what would be the impact if we have a very large population that moves into the district as far as displacing a charter school. So that's a very uh, sensitive area for me because not only is it something for us as far as we need additional space, a classroom or two, but it also displaces other students. So, uh, and on top of displacing other students at a charter school, it also lowers my uh, rental income. So it's, uh, it's a difficult task. Uh, that's, a, that's a pie chart, basically percentages of what we just saw. Again, 49% is a local tax, again, your property tax, and then the state aid is the, the 21%. The other part that I would like to point out at this stage is our budgeted fund balance, which you'll notice about three, which is something we'll talk about a little bit. Um, as I'm coming up with some, some scenarios, uh, I, I try to read a little bit of the tea leaves. So I, I came up with a, just a rough scenario where I get an idea of what the impact's going to be. So if I inf inflate, meaning increase our, our property tax to 38 million, and the budgeted fund balance, which is our surplus at the end of the year that we use for the, the, uh, the coming year, um, we'll reduce that by half. What, what type of impact will that have with my revenue? So if you notice, it's only about $131,000 difference. We have an offset, which is an increase in the tax levy and then a decrease in the available fund balance that we could use for the budget. So that's the thing I'm watching because that's a, a big nut to crack when we finish up the budget. So can I... Um just add to that. The budget fund balance you see there, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. So what that basically means is the school district every year is, is um, obligated to generate surplus. Okay? Now, a lot of districts, they expend 95% like of the budget. Every year, we have had to generate about $1.5 million in surplus, which for a district of our size, even the idea of generating $1 million in surplus is quite a bit of money. Okay, so what that means is that every year, the budget essentially, we have to hold out this money. Now, ultimately, it's taxpayers' money, so it comes back to you. It comes back to you. But the question becomes, as the district continues to trim the budget and we continue to have greater pressures placed on our budget, it's the ability of the district to generate that kind of surplus. And so that's a big issue that we'll be facing this year is do we have the ability to match the surplus that we've given back to the taxpayers in the past? That's going to be a problem. But again, on one hand, it's your money. It came back to you because it was unexpended. The problem, like I said, is the ability for the district to continue to do that. If the district continues to do that, right, to give back that amount of money, it's a great thing except for then what has to happen is it also affects the tax levy. And so it's a complicated issue that, um, like I said, the budget this year will, will have a lot to do with those numbers about budgeted fund balance. This is a more detail on some of the assumptions. So that 2% increase on the local tax levy is roughly 789,000, um, just off the top of my head. Um, again, charter schools, if I'm just looking at- Bill, that, we have to take a break, because- oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Okay, we're back. Okay. All right, where I left off is a little more added detail. What does it mean? I, I was saying it was uh, 789 is just a 2% increase on the tax levy. Um, the charter school increase, meaning that increase of 7.8, just for the 65 students that I had in the earlier slide, is roughly $750,000. So I already know that that increase of the 2% is, is going to be eaten up by the increase in the charter school allocation. So, um, so I have to look for other options. 
what they used last year is there's this concept of a bank cap. And it's, again, it's another uh, calculation the Department of Ed uh, provides for us, and it tells us how much we had, like an, I'll say, a spending authority for the prior year that we don't utilize. We can roll it over and use it in, in future years. So what the, the Board of Ed did last year was utilize 737 of that bank cap to go up and over the 2%. So we're going to have to revisit that this year, again, as an option. Um, we touched on this earlier. We have the minimum tax levy, which is last year's tax levy. That's pretty consistent over time. Um, and that's, we can't go below that. That's like a minimum that we're not uh, to go below, obviously. And then uh, this year, uh, and again, it's calculated, we have available, like we used 737 last year, the total amount banked to this point as of last year, uh, meaning the end of this year's budget cycle, is 872,000. So that's what, what we have, like, if you want to say the ceiling is up that high. Um, again, how far we go, that, that's not uh, determined at this point. But it is something that we have to bring into the conversation. The revenue for state aid, again, I want to know what 2% meant. It's about 100,000 a percentage, so that's what I'm looking at. So I just wanted to get that idea out there. Uh, it's not a lot of money, that's all I know, but okay. Um, fund balance, again, that's something that, I apologize, we'll get that slide fixed uh, when we get it up on the website. But um, that's our fund balance at the end of this fiscal period. So we had about $2.6 million available. So we used a uh, million six for this year's budget. And we had a remaining million dollars, but what I call rainy day fund, something in the bank that in the event there's unbudgeted items for this year, uh, we have the option, to, we have the option to utilize that and cover those unanticipated budget, you know, non-budgeted items. So, uh, you know, I would recommend keeping it as close to a million as possible. So, uh, early indications on what what we internally project uh, as a scenario for the end of you know this fiscal period is we probably will have 2.2. Again, some probably will argue with me on that, it's probably going to float down a little bit lower than that. Um, and we would have 800000 available for next year, again, as an assumption. And then if we had anything above that, that could be considered to be uh, used against the accumulated deficit for food service. So I just put that up there, and that would leave us in, in the remaining million dollars. Again, this is all the discussion and things that I need to concern myself with as I, as I build a budget. Um, the plan, the, Board of Ed has been working very hard on, on these, uh, these three components. One is to stop the bleeding, which is what uh, the superintendent was talking about, uh, changing the various uh, vendors that uh, operate it for us. Uh, we're getting closer to a break-even. We hope to hit that break-even this year. Uh, early indications are we're making further progress towards that. Um, we do have $150,000 reserve in this year's budget in the event we don't. Uh, so we did take that second step. And then the third step would be potentially consider an additional amount to pay down that accumulated uh, deficit at the food service in, by the end of June 30, 2015. Appropriations, again, I go in, I, I, I had to make assumptions as it relates to salary increases for the year. We talked about the collective bargaining agreements I have to do, uh, uh, adjust for. I have individual contracts for uh, not covered uh, units uh, or people, and I make some assumptions on my energy uh, and various other uh, non-salary expenditures. So a uh, quick down and dirty, uh, I, I felt about a million seven would be there, and that's just a 4.89%. Again, rough estimate as we continue to build the budget. But again, that's a, a larger number than the, the numbers I'm talking about as far as on the revenue side. So I already have a gap. Not only do I have a structural gap with my uh, surplus not being there potentially in the future, but I also have a budgetary gap, which is at million seven in my opinion. So I have to go to to make recommendations to potentially reduce that to get into balance. That's a rough estimation of where our money is. You can see on the very bottom, again, it goes back to the Abbott uh, regulations, whole school reform, school-based budgets are separated out and, and everything we advertise uh, has it still separated out. So that's about $21 million. Everything else is uh, pretty much our operating budget beyond that. Uh, so you see the food service reserve in there. You see a regular instruction at the top Student tuition is uh, just one category. Again, that's a, that's a significant amount. And district facility steps, you know. It, it, again, it's a, the pie chart's probably a little better. Again, you have a big portion of it is school-based budget. You still have the 750,000 increase, but the 7.8 million is a 15% uh, percent for charter schools. And then you have all the other. The only other area that jumps out to me, you know, for me is definitely uh, health benefits in the district facilities. Again, that's a picture as of 13, 14 budget. 
Some course drivers on, in, in 14, 15 are pretty much covered already. Uh, I think with the slides that we've had earlier, health benefits continue to be concerned. Norm last year, I'll say, we were already advised by the Division of Pensions and Benefits of what that increase will be for the next six months. I haven't received that yet, so I, I wait that number. That's going to be a pretty large incre uh, increase or inflator. Uh, energy costs, I already know that it's colder uh, uh, winter than we've had in the past, so I think my energy costs will be going up, and I've already covered the uh, salary increases. Uh, again, to build off of what we said before, it's the model adequacy spending. As I'm entering the data in for this coming period, which is 1415, these are uh, numbers that are calculated through the department's software. So last year, it calculated, as we said earlier, $180,000. And as we covered, I don't, don't want to go too much further outside of saying it's like a model that everyone's compared to. And it doesn't, it's not one size fits all for everybody. So it's not perfect, but it's just a way that they, the state of New Jersey county office identify uh, budgets that they have a concern with. So if you're under adequacy, it's a red flag. If you're well over um, you know, your, your, uh, your tax levy and it's on the high side, that's another red flag. So they may ask some addi additional questions and have uh, some follow-up concerns that they would have with us. But it, go, it goes through a little bit more scrutiny when you're below adequacy. Uh, again, I'm not going to bore you with that. Uh, administrative costs, again, that's something that's calculated with the software. Um, last year... Again. We... Oh, sure, I'm sorry. Yeah, I could, I could talk about it. Now. I won't go, I won't blow by it. Um, what happens with the, with the adequacy budget, as we saw the, the slow slide already here at Hoboken, that, that ends up being like a, uh, a spiral downward because you just keep cutting the budget and you become more and more uh, under adequate as far as budget spending. So it ends up being a, a downward spiral. When you're in that downward spiral, all, what happens is I call it the low dangling fruit gets cut from the tree. You don't have any more resources that are extras, we'll say, which is always a hard concept to get, get over. But then you end up with a, a meat and potatoes type budget where you're struggling just to keep that core educational component. And, and that's what I'm trying to do with that slide. Um, so I'll move on to the administrative cost. Again, as I enter all the data in this coming budget, it'll replicate the process. This was last year. We were under the administrative cost by about $304. So that's why I'm always surprised when people say we have unusually high uh, administrative costs here in Hoboken. Again, we're, we're below the regional limit, which is a northern section. There's three limits for the state of New Jersey. Um, part of this year's budget has uh, lease purchase application. Um, it's something I need to worry about because it's a financial obligation. So it's something about five years out. So I had to make sure that payment is in there. That includes principal and interest. So right now, in this period, it's $212,000. Next year, I'm budgeting about two hundred and ten. dollars So I have to make sure that's in there. Uh, and then there's a debt service. The good thing is this is retiring. So there's a, a positive impact on the overall scheme of, of property taxes. Um, with a school budget, you have two tax levies that you can raise, we'll say. One is for the general fund, that's the local tax levy. And then you have the debt service tax levy, which is as you get an approval for a uh, SDA project, in this case back from 1993, uh, there was a separate tax levy associated with that that the, the, the town had to uh, approve, the city approved, or we did it through a referendum. That was a commitment for 20 years, and we would raise that separately. So I would ask for that separate from my general tax levy, but they would transfer the same amount, but I would add that to the other number that you already saw. So if it's 37 million plus this amount, which is a separate levy, the good news is that it's expiring. I don't have to worry about that this year, but that means uh, the taxes, you won't see as much of a tax fluctuation from year to year because you'll have that retiring. Not to get too complicated. If anyone has a question they can ask later, I could talk to them separately on that. Uh, and, and that was for basically uh, asbestos removal and uh, tank remediation district-wide. Uh, again, pre-K program, I don't want to dwell on it too much. We already talked about it. It's about $10 million. It's totally separate from the general fund. Uh, it's a different process for a review and approval. We have the Department of Ed that, and the RAC, which is a new regional uh, accounting, uh, it's an accountability center. Uh, they will review it, and that's wholly separate from our operating budget, and it's for different uh, activities. Again, they're, they're looking for certain activities uh, that we then go through with them, as well as NCLB. Uh, so we have the state, this is a state program, the pre-K, and then this is the federal again. So uh, then they're basically the same issue. They give us a, an estimated uh, 
$9,000 for the NCLB, which is broken across various subgrants. Uh, they all have individual requirements to spend the money on. We do that, we get that approved separately, as well as the IDEA. IDEA does carry, again, it's a separate pot of money, I'll say, but it also carries uh, some of the cost for our special ed students, because the way we design that is all that, basically the $500,000 goes for student tuition. So that's the way we structured it. The state of New Jersey likes that, so we're gonna keep doing that in the future. Now this is the hard part of my position here, is to float uh, concepts that may, if come into fruition, may save the district some uh, money. So I'm, I was uh, uh, looking at areas that potentially could. Again, this is a early stages, and uh, these are things that we wanted to percolate at this point. Um, the first one, again, these are all different uh, scenarios. The first one, it starts off with instruction. Uh, you have to consider a half-day kindergarten program. It's not required, a full day is not required by state law. So if we went to a half day, again, I'm not sure uh, it's something that we will pursue, but if we did, that would probably save us around $300,000. Uh, pre -day, uh, half day preschool, we did the same thing. Um, yeah, that would save us about 100,000. If we wanted to address it through some savings in the instructional aid area, uh, if we just look at the kindergarten aids, which if we eliminated uh, all of the kindergarten aides uh, in our program, that would save us roughly 171. Instructional supplies, I know this year we spent roughly $300,000 on a, a district-wide textbook series, that's $300,000. I might have to consider percolating that further and saying that, that will potentially save us around 300 out of this budget cycle. Uh, we can concern ourselves with looking at the child study team. Um, if we went to an outsourcing, we might be able to say, save about 350. Maintenance projects, which is, as you know, with all the percentages is a large portion of our budget. We may have to continue to defer some of those projects. We've had about $700,000 a year uh, identified for uh, routine repair and maintenance programs. So uh, that might have to be deferred uh, for the future. And these are two other areas, uh, privatizing school clerks. If we eliminated the school clerk, again, it's something that we pursued. That may save us between 200 and 350, depending on how we structure it. If we wanted to go uh, and change the, the position itself as a school clerk, moving from a 10-month position, I mean, uh, excuse me, a 12-month position down to a 10-month position, that represents roughly around $75,000 savings. Um, school nurses, uh, if we reduced, uh, we'll say half to nurses, that may save us around $200,000. Outsourcing would get a little more complicated because we would have to concern ourselves with uh, finding a vendor that would provide the, the, the service, but there's there's definitely savings there. I don't know if it's to the, the degree of 75,000 uh, or not, but I'm still working on that. And then um, the privatizing custodial services, uh, we feel that probably save about 400,000 there, switching from our own custodial service into um, a private outsourced vendor. And then lastly, it would be to outsource our transportation service department which the whole thing going out would probably save us around $770,000. These are all really tough decisions that as I build the budget and find out that these gaps aren't closing through normal review of the budget as it's being created, uh, yeah, then we'll have to pursue some of these potential areas to reduce the budget because there's not much more we have left um, outside of these. And I think that's it. Okay. Good. So the, the next part of our, our presentation is a question and answer session. So we'll go in chronological order. The first thing is um, the residents of the community have submitted a bunch of different questions. And we had the Hoboken, I, I told you about that Hoboken, the budget questions, um, the email address. So does everybody have this? It says um, budget forum questions on the top. All right. Some people have them. Other people don't. So we'll, we'll pass that out. We'll go over that. While we're doing that, the other thing to know is that the presentation that we just had here tonight, that will be available. We'll, we'll put it on our website for those of you who'd like to relive this and, and watch the presentation again. Um, it'll be available on our district website. Uh, we'll try to get that up tomorrow. The other thing 
is that um, one of the slides, actually, I think is a, a little off with the, our enrollment. Our enrollment is 2477. I think what we did is we gave you a number related to our K-12 enrollment plus charter schools. So that's something that's going to change a little bit. But, um, but anyways, like I said, the, um, all the information that you have here tonight will be available if you'd like to see it again um, tomorrow or the day after, we'll get up on our, our district website. So anyway, okay, so questions. He said there's, there's a handful of questions that were submitted by residents. Now, the thing to understand is that the, the questions that were submitted are almost completely, I think they're all related to charter schools, okay? So there's a lot of questions about that, and there's some answers. And so what we'd like to do is just go over, um, we would like to go over all these different questions. And then I'm sure there's maybe some other questions that are out there. Um, you had a question that we, uh, requires some clarification, so we'll get to that. The, um, so the first question, who decides how each charter school is funded? So a resident asked that question. And so the answer is something we talked about a little bit earlier. So some of this was covered in the presentation. I'll, I'll move along pretty quickly with some of these. Um, the Department of Ed decides how charter schools are funded, including the amount of funding. So they decide how that is going to happen. They decide how much is going to be going to the charter schools. That includes our allocation. That includes a determination about state aid. Now, there's some other funding that's out there for charter schools. But the bottom line is, as far as we're concerned, the Department of Ed takes control of that. The school district does not. The Hoboken Board of Ed establishes a tax levy. And the charter schools are entitled to a 90% of a tax levy per pupil amount. But again, even that is calculated by the Department of Ed. So that's just um, that's one question. The next question, does the public school receive a 10% service fee from the charter school funds? And so the answer, there's a lot of different ways to think about this. One, the, the district does not receive a 10%, like a, a, a fee, administrative fee or anything like that. What we do receive back is we receive back a certain amount of funding so the charter school allocation is built with an assumption about Hoboken residents and how many Hoboken residents. So there's a projection that's made. And then from that projection, if there are differences between what's projected and what reality is, we get money back, but we get that back for different reasons. And so we get back about, about $300,000 every year. We get that back into our budget based on differences in charter school enrollment. Again, we don't do those, um, we don't do those enrollment projections. Those are things that are done with the Department of Ed and the charter schools. And the other thing is we don't control how much money we get back. So again, all this is tightly controlled by the state, by the Department of Ed, and like I said, that's something that really needs to be considered with all this, right? There's, there's nothing for anyone to be um, upset about regarding the Board of Ed or with the charter schools in terms of funding because there's almost nothing, there's almost nothing that is controlled locally when it comes to funding for charter schools and public schools. Yes. Yeah, we, we do. Mm -hmm. That's school choice. That's a separate issue. Yep. Sorry. Okay. So the question, the question was about Jersey City residents attending the Hoboken Public Schools. And so that is a source of revenue for us when we take them in under, under the or if they have charter school students who are from Jersey City that come to the charter schools, then that's money that we get back. And we initially pay it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So what happens is that the Department of Ed, yeah, we paid up front. So here, here's what happens. The Department of Ed, in making sure that there's funding that's available for the charter schools, okay? So they want to make sure that they are fully funded and they, they want to make sure that the money will be available. So they go operate under an assumption, they operate under a projection, and the district is responsible to provide the funding based on the projection. And then after the projection is tested, basically, with the, the enrollment count that the district does, October 15th, um, what we do is then we collect that information, all that's submitted to the Department of Ed, and they make a determination, okay, well, actually, the enrollment projections are a little bit off, but it is, but it, we do, ultimately, we are responsible to fund whatever projections are put together. So, can I add a little Go ahead. Bit? Yeah, to get back to the Jersey City question, they get an allocation that they're told, basically, this is how much you have to transfer. So for Jersey, uh, Jersey City students that go to, say, Ola, they have to pay their own amount separately from ours. But as the superintendent's saying, if they've displaced one of our students or if our enrollments drop and there's increased, you know, we'll get some money back because our students that they projected didn't materialize, 
uh, where Jersey City would then may increase, but that's a separate uh, amount of money that the OLA would receive from Jersey City, just like they received for our students from Hoboken at that charter school. So that, that, that it gets complicated, and, and like the superintendent is saying, it's really all controlled by the department, and we're advised of what, what we're to do. So uh, that, that's, that's how that would work. Yeah. So the other thing that I, I just like to offer for people to think about in terms of this whole issue of like a 10% bonus, the district um, over seven years experienced 175% increase in the allocation. In other words, 175% increase over the charter school allocation over um, from, from 2.8 million to 7.8 million. So certainly there's not many people that would see a 10% benefit to the district. That's a lot of money out of our, of our budget to support charter schools. So there is, there's, there's nothing that I could think of that would, um, we, we don't see that in our budget. There's no line item where 10% comes back to us. It just doesn't happen. Now, the other thing is, um, the, the other question is, does the district receive state and federal funding that it chooses not to share, share with charters? So the answer, the district receives all sorts of state and federal funding. You saw on the slide before. It's granted to the district based on applications we put in, based on the students we have, based on spending plans that we submit. And so ultimately, particularly with federal funding, um, it's very tightly controlled, as is state aid and everything else with school budgets. But um, the, the whole point being that the district is not able to modify a spending plan and simply share money. We're not able to do that. You have a plan, it's put together, it's for the students in this district, that is how money is awarded. However, there is federal funding that's part of, um, so federal funding is a package deal. In other words, we receive a certain amount of money, money from the federal government for different programs to support things, but with that, there are strings attached. One of them is there's administrative requirements. Okay, so just to give you some sense, in um, the private schools, there's a significant amount of funding that is in our budget. So it's kind of an interesting thing. So you don't think about this, and a few people probably know about it, but we have something called flow-through funding, federal funding, and what that does, what that means is basically for private schools, right? There's private schools that receive funding in this community through the district, so we administer the programs. They receive it for textbooks, they receive it for technology, they receive support services for some of their needier students. They receive child study team services, um, evaluation services. These are all things that this, the local board does for the private schools. So these are all services that we provide in the amount of about three hundred to $350,000 per year. So again, another amount of money that is in our budget, exists in our budget, but it's something that um, pe few people know about, but it's, not, it's, it's money that our students never see. It's not anything that um, you know, we could say is part of our cost per pupil, really, because we never see the money. Okay, um, so that's the flow through funding. Okay, um, the other question, if the district went to a referendum to exceed the 2% budget cap, how does that work with charter schools? What happens if the referendum fails but charter school expansion is improved? Can the charter school expansion funding be tied to the referendum? So charter school funding is not tied to any referendum. It can't be tied to a referendum. The charter schools receive an allocation, they receive their state aid that's determined by the state. Any referendum that the Board of Ed, if they decided to do that and say, well, listen, we would like to go to X percent of um, our, our tax levy increase, there is no way that the Board would be able to tie that. You could probably make a statement on the question, or you could write a statement explaining how the funding would be used and why there's a, a referendum. But as far as actually tying that, if the, if the, if the vote was no, right? there's nothing the board can do. The charter schools will always get the money because they're assigned a certain amount from the district budget and that comes from the state, like I said. Um, even if the referendum passes, what, what is the impact of charter expansion on the district when the district itself may have increasing costs it needs to fund? Okay, so the impact would be based on the amount of funding beyond the 2% cap, so it depends on what the referendum said and how that would affect it. Ultimately, it's hard to determine because we don't know it's a hypothetical situation. But again, going back to the whole idea, the charter school funding is guaranteed funding, right? They get that money, and that's how that works. Another question, why are there such discrepancies with charter school per pupil funding amounts when compared to the public schools? For example, one charter school recently posted on the website the following information as part of an appeal for donations. Because so they noted that the Hoboken Public Schools per pupil cost is 26,000, and you can read through that, right? That other schools are significantly less. And there's different reasons why that might be the case, and I would have to question some of those numbers, but the whole point being that there are some significant issues. And when you think about what we talked about before about the adequacy budget, 
the adequacy budget showing that, for example, an elementary school child, right, a few years ago, when that was produced, cost, is expected to cost about $10,000. And then there's, there's a geographic cost adjustment for Hudson County, it's about 3% increase over those figures. Um, so maybe it's $11,000. And you look at some other issues. For example, the, the differences in the student bodies. There are differences between the student bodies in the charter schools compared to the public schools. The students in the public schools, for the most part, generate quite a bit of funding. So as far as adequacy goes, it may be entirely possible may be entirely possible that the charter schools are operating above adequacy based on those numbers because there's very specific information with the adequacy budget that tells you all about, about how much you would expect to spend on a per pupil basis based on the different issues, um, the different things that the students are facing. So the other thing we have is we have combinations, right? We have students who are at risk who are also special needs students. And so it's quite a bit of funding that is expected to be spent on students with all these different needs. And those students, we, we do have a number of students. The other thing to keep in mind, and something we, we talked about a little bit before, is the issue of special education. One big part of our special education budget is for students with significant disabilities. Okay? The students who have significant disabilities in the district are in many cases educated in private schools for the disabled. Okay? And you can see with transportation, with tuition, with the cost of one-to-one -one aid, with the cost of an extended year summer program, with the cost of all the other supports and services for these students, it costs about $2.6 million. And that is a significant cost to the district. We do receive some, Bill, you got the? Yeah, I'm gonna, go ahead. Sorry, I'm just really trying to understand the process mm -hmm. here. Uh, don't you uh, get federal funding yes. in addition for that? We receive IDEA so, funding. Because I'm having a hard time when you're clubbing the kids with special needs together. Yes. Because I know that you get separate, you know, funding for them. Yes, we, we, but that's, that's the whole point. Right, that, that's, but that's the whole point, is that yes, we receive funding for it, but that also is going to increase our budget. That's going to increase our cost per pupil. That's, and that's the whole point here, is talking about the cost per pupil and the differences. So we have the students who are out of district placements. Many of them, you know, most, most of those placements run between fifty dollars and $100,000 per year. And we do sometimes get extraordinary aid, although it doesn't cover the full cost in any sense of the word. Right. Local tax base, you didn't include the federal funding in that. Right, but that's, 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 that's a separate issue. We, we, we are considering that. We know we received the federal funding for it, but the point is, is the total cost, that the, the total amount of money the district spends and what it costs per pupil. So that's a group of students that, say there, there's a, a, a few over 30, a few um, students beyond 30, 33? About 33. 33 students that we send out of district, but we expend quite a bit of money. So the whole point being that there's a significant cost per pupil factor with that group of students, and I wouldn't have it any other way. The bottom line is that these students have these specific needs, and I would not want to challenge that. They have their needs, and it's a good thing for them to receive the education that they deserve and they, they need. So, um, but we can talk about that, because I, I wanted to have the, I want to go sure. through this part, okay? Um, so then the other thing, the other difference is, is in terms of cost per pupil, the grade levels, right? The differences with the charter schools is, just a simple thing of grade levels. Elementary school students generate, or expected to, gener or to cost about 10, maybe $11,000 per student. Then we add in state aid, things like that. But the, um, the point being that charter schools also have a significant number. Most of the, the, the majority of their population is a population of students, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, right? Fifth grade. After that, the Hoboken residents, the, you know, th there's a reduction in uh, enrollment, particularly for Hoboken residents, to the point where you get to the high school. So there's two of the charter schools that have uh, middle school grades, and then you have, well, then you have um, one charter that has high school students, although very few of them are Hoboken residents. So that's also a factor, and that's something that should be recognized. It costs more, right, to educate high school students. We have a lot more high school students in the district. So those are just some ideas, some, some important things I think that, that should be considered. And um, let's see, what else do we have here? Yep. For the, for the charter schools, I 
think that it also um, includes facility allocation, which is not the case. In other words, uh, charter schools are not given their facility, so right. they have to pay for that out of uh, the per pupil cost. Am I understanding that correctly, or I, I think I think one of the charter schools pays right. They pay one dollar, and they don't they don't do the maintenance. So that's Which one is that? I think do you guys it's fifty thousand. The dollar. No, our you have a rent. You have a, you have a certain amount you paid. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, the point being that we, we have buildings, and, and even though you know, maybe, maybe we're talking about two separate things, we have, we have maintenance costs, right? We have these buildings, we, we have to maintain them, we have, there's, there's a whole lot of costs with that. So I'm just trying to get to apples to apples, that's all. So maintenance costs also exist for the charter schools. But the point is that, I think anyway, I don't, this is what I'm asking, this building is probably owned. I mean, it's not something that you pay rent right. on or a mortgage. Right. Whereas the, the figure that we're look, the lower figure that we're looking at for the charter schools, there's a percentage allocation that I guess goes to the facility uh, in like for Hoboken Charter, for instance, in the form of a mortgage or for, for a lesion in the form of rent. Right. All true. Okay. But again, we have we have lots of other costs. So that th th your point is well taken, though, regarding there's a difference between the charter schools and the public schools in terms of the requirement to pay essentially pay rent of some sort. Um, I was just thinking maybe it would be easier for the general public and for the members of the community if you actually did a breakdown further uh, and make your job harder, I'm sorry, but um, if you looked, if you wanted to compare apples to apples, if we just took K through 5 and compared it against OLA and then K through 12 and compared it against Hoboken Charter mm -hmm. and K through 8, I think is a lesion, Don't, I'm not 100% right on that it, right mm -hmm. but if we then we broke it down like that and then maybe even further than showing um, maybe this is what it would be if we didn't have the IEPs that we have to pay for right. which maybe Hoboken Charter and so maybe that would be more beneficial because sure. there would probably be alleviate some of this big discrepancy there's, there's not a discrepancy in terms of like I said the cost for people with the adequacy budget. To show further that, you know, what we're actually spending, because obviously people think that we're spending way too much money. Right, okay. And Hoboken Public, whereas other schools are. When you peel away all these other, other things, things. other factors. Right, to and make also them you look at the tax viable. levy. Okay, all right, good suggestion. All right, there's, um, there's one last question that was submitted, and the question is Is there a lot of fat in the district budget? Okay. So the answer to that. I guess is, um, it depends who you talk to in town, but the, the whole point that I would like to make is that over, over the years that I've been here, so I've been here three years now, and I do know this, the Board of Ed has spent a tremendous, tremendous amount of time looking at our budget, looking at different line items, looking at different things that need to be, um, you know, to, to be reduced, and you see some good evidence of that when we did our PowerPoint. Right? There was a lot of different things, the budget, of the district has been reduced in lots of very important areas, areas that most districts are never able to touch. We've been able to touch, we've been able to have some success with that. You also have some lingering issues that the district faces here in terms of food service, right? A lot of it has to do with people, like I said, not paying for school lunch. So there's also some other things, like I said, with the money we're giving back. Ultimately, our budget is actually less than what it is in terms of um, the actual dollar amount because there's a significant amount of that, 1.6 million, that goes back to the community. So that's another important piece there. So all these things are a part of our budget picture and when the time comes for the actual construction, the final construction of the budget, we discussed some very difficult decisions. That's where we are right now. Now, the complication is that if you start a school and ultimately you outsource services. In other words, if you're brand new and you outsource services or you know, maybe there's other services you could find for a low, lower cost, that's not a hard decision. But is it a hard decision if we're talking about transportation? We're talking about custodial service. We're talking about privatizing, right? Every, everything that's not bolted down is what we talked about in terms of privatization. Now, that's something, like I said, that is considered in lots of communities in New Jersey and all over the country. I would say, well, just privatize, privatize this, privatize that. And it's an easy thing to say, but then the actual doing is a, is a totally different story. And the reason I say that is because these are people who have connections in the community. These are kids, um, these, I'm sorry, these are, on well, some cases, they are former students. In other cases, these are people who work in the community, have worked here for years. These are people who have relationships with families. These are people who serve as volunteer coaches and, and all sorts of other things in the community. 
So people in this community would definitely be hurt by, by some of those actions. And that's what makes it a very hard thing to do. So um, the board does face a laundry list of very unpleasant decisions, very unpleasant things that people in the community will not respond well to. Um, and, and I suppose if, if the goal is only to just continuously reduce costs, then there's an easy decision to make. If the goal is to provide the best education we can, then that becomes, that's expensive, it costs more. So that's a decision that the board is gonna be making. We've had a lot to say, okay? Um, Actually, I do have a question about go. the presentation had, uh, I, I don't want the mic, please. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, we, have, the, we have to record you so people can uh, hear what you had oh, to say, because yeah, yeah. this is uh, going to be broadcast. The presentation had a lot of broad aspects to it, but other yep. school districts actually break it up, like you had a 27.6 million Oh, we do all that. It's just, this for, is... For the staff, for instance. So how much of it is actually going to the teachers? How much of it is right. going to the administrative we, staff, you know, the custodians, the security yep. guards, we, all of that? We do... So that's in, what, in that painstaking detail. Would not arise if you had a breakup of that, and that right. was what I expected to see in nope. today's meeting. Nope. And the second part is, we didn't discuss the 24 million at all. Like, what's the other 24 million going to? Because you've discussed 27, and you have a budget of 51 million. And somehow I saw somewhere 64 million in the papers, but that yep. may be totally off. But so you discussed the 27. Where, what about the 24 million? Where does where does that? You want, you want to yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that. That goes back to the uh, school-based budget piece. Is that what you're asking? It's like, I think it was like $22 million. That's a transfer out to what we call school-based budgeting. Basically, what that is, it's going to it's going to cover um, salaries, benefits, so instruction. Million, right? it, was, the, it was it was about 20. You had the 27 million, and you had the 20, and but your entire budget is 51 million. Right. So there's 24 million which we didn't discuss at all. Right. Well, what happens is that's outside the operating budget. If you're talking about the federal dollars, there's another 10 million dollars for say um, preschool. Uh, it's our pre-K program for three and four-year-olds. That's on top of that. So when you add that all up, you'll get to 64. But the only portion of the budget that we're really talking about today happens to be our operating budget, which is at 51 million dollars. That's based on, on last year. So your 51 million dollars, you showed us that 27 million goes towards the payroll. You know, mm -hmm. for the oh, on a previous slide, right? But where does the 24 million? Okay. That's yeah, I, I, I can talk. Is yeah, maybe I'll talk to you afterwards right. if you can. I, that's I'll the way to go. Now, the, the other thing that is important is, as far as your understanding what was going to happen today, this is not a budget hearing. The Board of Ed runs a budget hearing, and all sorts of different information about the budget is shared line by line. We cover all the major categories. We cover all the different things that the um, you know that the, the Department of Ed requires us to give you as far as the budget. So you you do get a lot of information about how much salaries go to the teachers and how much salary, how much money is connected with the transportation operation. they will give you total transportation, so you'll get that. But that's not, that's not today. Today is guided by general information that people have asked about or people want to know about. Yes, sir. Um, you, I think, during the change of you would clarify the enrollment for the pre-K to 12 is actually 24 for 10 students? 2477, I think that's right. Sorry, so that number that you have on your sheet, I'll, that's I'll wrong, that has to be okay. adjusted. That's the charter school Plus, in other words, the Department of Ed doesn't do us any favors in terms of community where we have charter schools because a lot of the information you get about enrollment is for the whole city. And a lot of it has to do with K-12, to and it has to do with K-12 to plus cent students. So if you see that somewhere, that means the charter schools. Those are, those are students, but a lot of the information that's out there that's probably just pulled from yeah, somewhere Yeah, I'll double check it and make sure it's right on this presentation. I, I, yeah. It's 2477. I think that's, that's going to be the accurate number. Take a look tomorrow. We'll yeah. have the accurate numbers up there. Yeah. Okay? Or the day after. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'd like to ask the business administrator. Go ahead. If, um, if we figure out that it costs us $19,000 a year to educate a Hoboken high school student, just pick a number, and uh, we take a school choice kid from Jersey City, and in Jersey City it costs them. Well, the, the charter, the school uh, choice, you're talking, well, if I'm talking, you're talking school choice program, correct? Correct. Okay. That's a calculated amount that we get directly as a form of state aid from, from the Department of Education State of New Jersey. So it's based on enrollment that we project. They'll then put that into their state aid calculations and come up with a number that we're going to receive from the state of New Jersey for that program. So for, I think it was $2.8 million we had. So in the Given those numbers, what would you expect? 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if there's a cost per pupil that the state uses, but it's based on how many, like for example, this year is a 5% restrictor on it, but there, I don't have a, a, a cost per pupil for you that I use for the budget. Do you want me to answer? Uh, yeah, maybe. Yes. The answer is yes. And, and the reason why is because. So, yeah. so that includes it. Here's, what, here's the benefit. Okay, the benefit is this school choice is built on the. You have to have some planning. You have to do some advanced planning. You have to know what you're talking about. And you have to, have to anticipate enrollment. And you have to know if there are grade levels, for example, where enrollment drops. Okay, and you're still hiring a teacher, and you're still running a classroom, and you're still buying all the supplies for the classroom, and say theoretically, because of a change of enrollment in a, in a grade level, or maybe there's a small class, maybe you have a classroom of 14 kids, say by the end of the year. So you can anticipate, say theoretically you decided, I'm gonna bring in five school choice students. The question is, does that cost anything for the school district to bring in those additional five students? The answer is not really because ultimately that classroom's there, the teacher's there, the books are there, everything that's needed is already there. And the same thing with the high school. We have staffing, so we don't have to hire additional teachers. We don't have to hire, that's, that's why that is such a big part of our budget, is because with the planning and identifying where students will fit into the district, it really doesn't cost the district a whole lot of money. It probably costs us very, very little money because ultimately we're replacing students that we have the structure to accommodate. Mr. McConnell. It is spending money in a way that increases enrollment. But would you say that's like, you know, tacitly agreed to as an underlying assumption? I would say that in, in our district, it depends on what the state does with state aid. Okay, so for example, if they just flat fund or reduce state aid and we, get, we have no other way of raising revenue, there's, there's, there's a lot of moving pieces to a budget. And so in a lot of cases, increasing enrollment would, um, it, it, it may be helpful, it may not be. It depends okay. on what grade level, depends if you have to hire teachers. The other thing, like, you know, um, there's also an interesting issue in the district and I, and I checked up with our, um, our attendance officer. So we have an attendance officer who checks to see if people live in the district. Now, ultimately our enrollment, and this is really kind of a strange thing, our enrollment is, um, is reduced. And over the past few years, there are approximately 165 students who are identified, who were attending schools here, who were sent to their home district because by law, you're supposed to attend the school in the community you live in unless there's school choice, unless you're attending a charter school, there's some options out there. But the point being that the district sent 165 students back to their home district, okay? Now, would that, would that be an easy way to reduce our, our cost per pupil by a few thousand dollars? The answer is yes. Cost per pupil would be reduced, but, um, but ultimately then you pick up this group of students. So that's kind of, a, it's an interesting situation. Would we get the state aid for those students? The answer is yes we would get the state aid. But like I said, you have that requirement. If you don't send them out, then you're not following the law that you're supposed to be following as far as uh, you know, students and, and where they're enrolled you know, based on their residency. So all very interesting questions. Hard to answer that one though. Okay. Listen, we have, um, we have a board meeting that we still have to run and it, I, I didn't realize it was nine o'clock. It's nine. So um, I was hoping if there's any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them if you email me. If you email Mr. Moffitt, if there's anything you want to talk about, we, we really have to get going because it's, it's 9 o'clock. It's getting late. All right, we have, we have some presentations, so thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.